cool. So there was that early motivation that kind of kicked off your you were involved or you developed the Progpow mining algorithm. Was that <laughs> kind of kicked off from that early motivation or how did that come about? No. Uh so Progpow comes from a different place. So I think it was around twenty it was either 2017 or 2018, there was a lot of discussions about Ethereum ASICs on the Ethereum network. And a particular uh, core developer um, had put out a a call for an alternate proof of work algorithm. So this was the time Bitmain had just finally released their uh, first Ethereum, uh, Ethereum ASIC. And for those of you who are familiar with uh, with that device, the E3, it was you know, pretty, pretty simple. It was some DDR3 RAM uh, strung together with a really basic compute core. But it was causing a lot of uh, drama in the Ethereum ecosystem. So there it was this call pulled out for alternate proof of work algorithm proposals. And um, myself and two other friends, Def and Else, were sitting there looking at all of these proposals and the suggestions that had come up. There was one guy who was a trying to build an FPGA startup at the time that was uh, proposing a one-time change to the algorithm, which would have made FPGAs like way more efficient than GPUs. And I thought that's really stupid. At first, I thought you know he just didn't understand. Now I suspect it was intentional, probably malicious. We had um, we had every other algorithm and coin under the sun trying to pitch their algorithm. And the problem with most cryptocurrency developers is they don't have the necessary background in hardware. They don't understand how their software is going to translate to bare metal. This is a skill that's not often taught, um, you know, in traditional software development. And crypto is one of the few intersections where you need to understand how your code is performing on bare metal to be, you know, your most efficient for your users. I can see so, those music to Marco's ears. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I know a guy who, who talks just like you. Uh, yeah. So we got super, super frustrated, right? We got um, a little bit angry seeing all of these shitty proposals. And then one you know, one uh, weeknight, we were like, you know what, let's let's just do our own. We had no idea what we were doing when it when it came to Ethereum governance, but we built the first uh, prototype and white paper for ProgPow. And then uh, we went straight to Vlad Zamfir and like told him about this. And uh, he gave us a lot of guidance on how to create an EIP and, you know, push it through the proposal. We went through that. It was hard. Like writing the algorithm was easier than uh, getting it through the Ethereum governance. Um, so we created the EIP and then, you know, got everything kind of set out, threw it out there and didn't hear anything for six months. And by that time, uh, you know, Def and Else had moved on to other things I had as well. I just joined Core Scientific. So I was working as, a, you know, as a CTO there. And um, out of the blue, uh, Powell, um from uh, Ethash, um, from uh, Ethash optimizations, as well as um, Ethminer reaches out and says, hey, there's, you know, a lot of excitement about ProgPow. Would you like to come speak at it, um, about it at DevCon? Uh, and I was very excited to do that, but also kind of surprised that six months later, it's finally starting to pick up headwinds. And uh, so we did that. And yeah, that's the story behind Prog Pow. It was really just spurned out of frustration over the fact that people who did not understand hardware were pretending to be hardware experts and were going to create another flawed algorithm, which is what Ethash was. It didn't sufficiently saturate GPU cards. It, it barely used all of the memory accesses available. Um, and, you know, we were... We were quite proud of it. Um, we were quite proud of the early days of ProgPow development. We had a lot of um, peer reviews by Samsung and their uh, memory division. We had peer reviews from Intel. We had peer reviews from, you know, other uh, experts in the Ethereum space. Eventually, Bob Rao stepped in and did the hardware audit. Um, it was amusing to see a lot of the uh, 
now it's amusing to see a lot of the uh, drama and conspiracy theories that uh, Prog Pal created. Um, and it was also very telling, for me at least, to be able to observe the ASIC manufacturers. It, it allowed me to see who was actually a legitimate like hardware competitor and who was full of shit. And so Bitmain, if you ever noticed, Bitmain never stated they could build an ASIC for ProgPal. Bitmain did one small campaign for April Fools against ProgPal, and that was it. They never um, created any FUD. They never created any drama because they understood intimately what it was. Whereas uh, for those from those days who remember Lindsay, uh, Lindsay was the... um, Lindsay Chen, who was at uh, Chen Min, who was the former CTO of Canaan, left to start uh, Lindsay ASICs. And uh, they created a lot of controversy and a lot of political drama around ProgPal because it threatened, you know, their bottom line. They had just spun out to go and develop an Ethereum ASIC, and along comes ProgPal, which could jeopardize that entire business. Um, and uh, they put the I think they put the Ethereum core team and some of the Ethereum contributors through absolute hell. There was a lot of personal attacks, a lot of drama, just a lot of smear campaigns. And, uh, you know, two, three years later, uh, Lindsay, Lindsay blew up. Their ASIC was a failure. Uh, their, um, it, it couldn't even uh, beat out you know, Silicon's ASICs. It was, over, it was way too expensive for a consumer miner. Um, they faded off into a relevance and uh, yeah, it's, it was a, even though at the time prog power was incredibly stressful for me as both an engineer, as well as a contributor to the Ethereum ecosystem, it taught me a lot about the flaws in Ethereum's governance. It taught me a lot about how, you know, the, the darker side of miners, which I had never seen before. Um, and it taught me a lot about how easy it can be to manipulate um, people in the Ethereum ecosystem or probably any other protocol when you're speaking about a area that doesn't have a lot of expert, uh, that the, the team doesn't have a lot of expertise in. Because at the time, not anymore, but at the time, I think uh, if Def else was one of the only hardware experts in the Ethereum ecosystem. Um, so, yeah, it was an interesting experience. Um, would probably not do it again. <laughs> <laughs> Can you remember us why the why Procpo wasn't implemented? I remember at that drama time there was like bu- drama. It was, just because drama. it was drama. Honestly, the so many so towards the end. It was greenlit for inclusion into the testnet, and then eventually a mainnet plan was going to be put in place. And then what happened was Lindsay started a smear campaign that attacked quite a lot of prominent members of the Ethereum core team. There was a lot of drama between uh, different Ethereum core teams, namely the Parity, the former Parity team, um, coming against the Geth team. And look, engineers just want to build code. They don't want to get into politics, right? Yeah. Um, I remember the constant smear campaigns coming out against Core Scientific and against myself, you know, saying Core Scientific had created this algorithm and was trying to uh, push it into Ethereum to profit off it. Uh, never mind that Ethereum, uh, Core Scientific never had a large GPU mining operation to begin with. Um, it was drama. Drama killed it. And you know, towards the end, uh, miners started believing all of the FUD and actually pushed against ProgPal. And I now... Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, go. I remember at the time everybody was testing uh, ProgPal, like yeah. what the new GPU came out and what's the performance on the uh, it hash versus ProgPal. Yeah. Yep. You know, now miners are complaining about proof of stake and complaining about the merge, but The thing is that they could have, if things had gone differently and ProgPal had been implemented, we would have had, you know, probably three or five more years of proof of work. I truly believe that. 
but miners quickly brought into all of the FUD and all of the hype and a lot of the Ethereum, uh, sorry, a lot of the ASIC and FPGA miners joined on that train as well and, you know, just killed it. Um, it passed all of its audits. It had ProgPow, you know, was tested. It was even implemented in Geth. Like it was, it was ready to go, but it, it was a difficult situation because how do you actually tell whether or not the community wants something? How do you measure that sentiment? We do not have good tools for measuring sentiment outside of a hard fork in crypto. Um, Twitter polls don't work. Uh, no sort of on-chain governance tools work. You know, we did, um, there was a gas voting tool. There was a uh, token voting tool for for or against PrugPal. Like none of this works, right? Um, it's it, it was a really hard problem to solve. Uh, so yeah, the final decision, which was in March, um, sorry, May of 2020, March or May, March it was, because uh, I was in Paris and I caught COVID <laughs> right after. Um, March of 2020 was, you know, it would sit in testnet, it would sit in the back pocket as a deterrent, but uh, the Ethereum core teams would push full steam ahead for proof of stake and kick out proof of work as soon as they could. Um, we can question the decentralization with this, like who actually I, decides, decides about what gets implemented? Well, I think decentralization did work. Miners voted against PrugPal and they didn't get PrugPal. That was that yeah. that truly was it. I remember so many of the GPU miners brought into all of the 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 FUD right about how AMD cards would not be as efficient as NVIDIA cards and this favored NVIDIA. They never did their own research. And those same miners are the ones that are now complaining that, you know their profits have been reduced and that there is nowhere else for their cards to be, to be uh, operating and running. Um, I, you know, in hindsight, um, I don't think the right way to run a layer one protocol is to dive headfirst into decentralization. I think that you need a small core team that is centralized, that is making decisions to get product market fit. And then decentralization is a playbook. It's a progressive thing. You have to take steps to give the community more ownership, but you also need to teach the community about the core principles and why they're important and why you've made these design decisions. Satoshi did this. Satoshi uh, was very good in that, you know, he laid the groundwork for the initial community to uphold his vision of Bitcoin. He spent a lot of time on the forums, educating, teaching. He kept it all to text so that things would be, you know, uh, left behind when he when he uh, went on to new things. And in Ethereum's case, they tried to jump headfirst into decentralization, which created uh, decentralization theater. You know, the the illusion that things are decentralized and you get a very apathetic and sometimes very greedy community. Ethereum doesn't have that issue anymore. Um, but from, I would say, 2016 to 2018, that uh, definitely was a, a major issue that Ethereum had. You know, most of the, the mining community was pretty apathetic. Uh, they didn't spend a lot of time understanding the inherent upgrades and changes and didn't get involved with the Ethereum core development. They really only cared about what affected their bottom line. Um, that's not what you want from a mining community. You want them to be like the Bitcoin mining community, which in my experience does invest quite a lot of time in understanding what is going into each uh, BIP and what is you know, happening in the ecosystem and what's on the horizon.